This is Brandon Bussey, and you're listening to the Providence Hockey Report. Welcome to the Providence Hockey Report podcast, the ultimate destination for everything you need to know about the American Hockey League Providence Bruins. Join Bruins hockey writers Mark Allred and Kenny Kaminsky as these line mates get together each week to break down the latest games, discuss player performances, and keep you updated on all the news from the top minor pro affiliate of the NHL Boston Bruins. We appreciate the download, and without further ado, here's Mark and Kenny. Enjoy the show. Hello, Bruins fans, and welcome to Season 1, Episode 2 of the Providence Hockey Report Podcast in partnership with the Cyclone Sports Podcast Network and the Black and Gold Productions Sports Media Company. I'm your host, Mark Allred, and you can follow me on Twitter or X at Black and Gold 277. And you can also read my Bruins related articles on the blackandgoldhockey.com website. Um, the gentleman to my left or right uh, is fellow company colleague and Bruins prospect writer, Kenny Kaminsky, who is the uh, new co host of this weekly program. So, Kenny, welcome to the show, my man. And please uh, tell the listeners and viewers where to follow you and where we can read your work. Yeah, you can uh, read the work at blackandgoldhockey.com, and then you can follow my Twitter down here. It's just my name, Kenny Kaminsky. Awesome. Uh, thanks again, Kenny, for uh, for joining us, uh, or for joining me on this uh, this new endeavor that I've been trying to, uh, you know, basically get off the ground for a while now. Uh, the procrastination and the lack of time, um, uh, no more. Uh, we're, we're off and running right now, and I'm really excited to have you. And really uh, stoked that you uh, you came in and asked to be a part of it. So uh, I really appreciate that as well. Yeah, of course. I mean, this is sick. You know, I love I love prospects and you know Providence Bruins hockey. So excited to be a part of it. Awesome. Uh, we kindly ask that you subscribe to our weekly Providence Hockey Report podcast on worldwide listening platforms such as Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and Spotify Podcasts for the audio version of this program, and also subscribe for the video version, as your many viewers are looking at right now on our official Black and Gold Productions YouTube channel by typing in the search bar at Black and Gold Productions LLC. Um, before this weekend's action um, that we'll get to later, uh, the Providence Bruins played four games to start the 2024-25 regular season and had a 2-2 two two record uh, sitting in lower in the Atlantic Division and giving up more goals than they've uh, actually put in offensively. Uh, so, Kenny, why don't we just start by, like, just basically going over, like, our thoughts of the first four games and how, um, you know, basically everything went going two and two. Yeah, I just, um, you know, it's the first four games of the season. There's younger players on the roster. I was at the first game uh, against Laval, and um, you saw the the defense was divided one veteran was with one younger guy and you could see Laval was uh, targeting some of those younger guys and you could see it on the Logan Mayu goal that was all over Twitter where he makes a nice move on Jackson Edward and then puts it past Bussy. but it's the first four games of the season so you know I like I like seeing some of the younger guys and what they were able to do and you know but now once you get through the first five I think it's time to start you know doing what's best for the team maybe cutting younger guys minutes I don't know but I think it's just it's time to start putting it on now and, and really getting into the season. I totally agree. Um, my thoughts on the on the season thus far before the games we're going to talk to against Hershey, uh, talk about against Hershey. Um, you, you know, I, I do agree with a lot of the points that you've made, but I also like this is a it's not going to sit well with fans because they don't they don't like this hearing this because every professional athlete is supposed to have a great attitude you know, and, and blah, blah, blah. But there is a time in each season, as I've covered this, the American Hockey League for a long time, and I've talked to fellow people, colleagues in the industry, there's a certain time period where you get cut from an NHL club, which is not easy. And there's an adjustment that needs to be made. So when you go down, it's not a sulking period, but it's more of a, oh, this sucks to be down here. And you're trying to figure out your way, how to get back up there and so on. So I just think that there's a couple of players on this team right now that might be going through a little bit of that, but this is common. We've, I've seen this hundreds of times before. 
Um, and I believe in this team. I believe this team can turn it around and everybody will get on pace and, you know, and, and go for the common goal of if I'm on this team, I'm going to, you know, help and, and, and participate and try to get into a, you know, a call to cup playoffs, which will probably be nine years in a row if they make it this year. So there's always a goal, but there's also that developmental curve that a lot of these players are continually, um, you know, working on down at this, at the American hockey league level. So I think it's all going to turn around. I'm not, I'm not all doom and gloom yet and so on. Um, the American hockey league's primarily a developmental league and, you know, it's not really about standings and so on and, and scores. And, but you know, it's nice to have, it's nice to keep track of, and it gives us some, some news to talk about, but um, you know, I'm just, I'm, I feel good about this team. I, I uh, Ryan Wuchanel is a really good coach along with Trent Whitfield and Matt Brown. Um, so I, you know, I, I think they can definitely turn it around. Yeah, I think they could they could turn it around. And, you know, to your point there, uh, you know, living in Connecticut, there's uh, Quinnipiac University down here. And something that they do, you know, and they talked about this on the local TV station a while back. You know, when when you're at that level, you know, and you keep making, you know, the, the conference championships and you keep making the playoffs and you keep making the postseason and you're making these runs to the NCAA championship, it's no longer a goal. It's just an expectation. And I expect that this team, with the talent that they have, that they're going to be able to make it to the Calder Cup playoffs. Yeah. Uh, real quick before we get to some Bruins news, uh, what are your thoughts on the early thoughts on um, – Chris Pelosi, and um, I believe his name is Elliot Groenwald, the defenseman. Yeah, there's a there was another clip that was uh, on Twitter. Elliot Groenwald, no stick, putting his body on the line, blocking shots. Quinnipiac had a, a, uh, a tough start, but uh, Chris Pelosi looks very, very good. And I knew uh, after watching that first exhibition game that he was going to be in uh, an ideal situation for him, and it, and it shows because – what he has like two or three points to begin the season as a freshman, which is, you know, really impressive, especially for a team like Quinnipiac that retains a lot of their players. There's, there's a ton of seniors and a ton of upperclassmen on that team to, to see Chris Pelosi, you know, put his mark on the game is, is huge. And Elliot Gronwald, again, he's in that situation, but the Bobcats are so, you know, good defensively that it's tough for him to try to make his mark, but he, he's been doing a good job. Yeah, uh, I was watching, I believe, the uh, the weekend series against Maine, and um, they did an interview with uh, with, with Quinnipiac Bobcats so, uh, head coach Rand Pecknold, and um, and when he talked about the Bruins prospects, uh, Elliot Groenwald and Chris Pelosi, uh, he was really excited about their upside and what what they could bring not only this year as freshmen, but also in their uh, sophomore and junior year as they continue to develop and so on. So a lot of good things that are coming up for the Boston Bruins prospects and so on. And um, I'm happy to have a, a, you know, a person like you aboard our, our sports media company to gravitate some attention to some of these players down there and, 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 uh, you know, produce uh, well-written articles about their uh, updates and so on. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's crazy, but like these guys are are playing very well, and they're not even the best prospects that the Bruins have at that level. I mean, guys like Ty Gallagher. I mean, last year I was expecting big things, and and he had five points, and he you know got a change of scenery, and now he's just he's playing really well over at Colorado College. That was another player that I that I wrote an article about, and I wanted to highlight him for a little bit. You never know who's watching, so he's uh, there's just so many good prospects that I was that I was baffled when I saw how low the Bruins prospects were ranked league wide compared to other teams. I mean, I'm looking at these other, these other pipelines and I'm like, these, I don't think that these are a, as good as, as Boston. So for Boston's to be ranked below them, it was tough to, it was tough to see. Yeah. All right. Let's, uh, let's bring it back to uh, some AHL news um, and particularly the the Providence Bruins. Uh, the Providence Bruins have a new team captain after going a full season last year without a definitive leader. Um, on October 17, 2024, the AHL Bruins named veteran forward Patrick Brown as the team's 27th captain in, team, in the club's history. Uh, Providence head coach Ryan Mujanel had this to say about Brown being named team captain per the AHL Bruins official website. We are very fortunate to have Patrick Brown lead our group, said Mujanel. Head coach of the Bruins, Patrick is an ultimate competitor and uh, consummate professional. He, um, three, two, one. 
He makes everyone around him better, both players and coaches. We look forward to his continued leadership and his ability to demonstrate what it means to be a Bruin. Kenny, what are your thoughts on the decision to name Patrick Brown as the uh, Providence Bruins 2024-25 season captain? I like it. I like that they gave it to a, a skilled guy like Patrick Brown, who also has that uh, that veteran leadership to him. But I was uh, I was on YouTube and and I was watching this video. It was about um, I forgot what team. I think it was the Barry Colts, and their coach was reading the list of captains that they had for the season. And at the end, he said, "These are the captains that we picked." But if we don't have a locker room full of leaders, then we're not going to do anything this season. And I think that Providence has a locker room full of leadership. So, you know, Patrick Brown definitely deserves it. But I think that it takes a lot of weight off of his shoulders, knowing that he has guys like Sweezy and Letary who weren't necessarily in Providence last year, but they are veterans of the game. Yeah. And, and Brown said this uh, in the um, AHL Bruins official website. It's an honor. I'm super excited to be a leader of this group, said Brown. There have been a lot of uh, great leaders that have come through here. Tommy Cross, Trent Whitfield, Josiah Didier, and Paul Carey, just to name a few. It's an honor, and I'm really excited to get going. Um, so that's what he had to say. Uh, the official Providence Bruins um, website article also mentioned the naming of alternate captains. Uh, defenseman Michael Callahan, forward Vinny Letary, defenseman Jordan Orsele, and defenseman Billy Sweezy were named to the leadership group. Thoughts on the additional uh, members below uh, Patrick Brown when it comes to um, the leadership of this team. Yeah, it's, a, it's again, a bunch of veterans. And it's just funny that there's so many of them because, like I said, I was just naming them off. Yeah, Like I said, having all of those players be in there and, you know, just having somebody on, like, each line or having somebody, you know, two people on defense and then three on forward just – for like one of the younger guys to come talk to, especially on that defense that's so young. I think it's huge. Yeah. Uh, moving on to some more news. Providence Bruins general manager Evan Gold announced uh, on October 17, 2024, that the AHL Bruins have signed forward Tyler Pitnick, Pitlick to an American Hockey League professional tryout. The 32-year-old versatile forward who can play center and right wing is 6'2", 201 pound, Minnesota native, who was originally drafted by the Edmonton Oilers back in the 2010 NHL entry draft and has most recently been with the New York Rangers organization, appearing in 34 games at the NHL level, posting one goal, three assists, four points, and uh, three goals, four assists, seven points in the American Hockey League with the Hartford Wolf back in 22 games last year. Uh, thoughts from you, Kenny, on the professional tryout agreement on this a veteran forward and how he's looked in recent action with the Providence Club. He's looked really good, I thought. I mean, he has two points, and uh, this may be stupid to say, but I, I honestly think that this is something that, that benefits both parties. I think Pitlick, knowing that there really isn't, isn't a role for him in Boston, especially coming to a new franchise, him knowing that he's going to be in Providence and he doesn't have to, you know, carry the weight of the world on his shoulders. And we I saw it in the first game where he made that pass to Farinacci and Farinacci ended up taking it to the front and scoring instead of him trying to be a hero and maybe make a move to the middle and take a tough shot that, you know, it, you, you don't ever know. So, and, and again, he looked good. The fundamentals is huge. Like Hunter Shepard was a brick wall in net this week, as you'll see, uh, he turned away, I think like 62 of 64 shots. And but those are the goals that you need. And you'll see it in a little bit that uh, following your rebound. I mean, a shot missed the net and then he, he comes in and scores off the off the rebound. So it's huge. And I really like this pickup for Providence. Yeah. Another another leader in the room. You know, you, you cannot have enough of those guys at this particular level. Um, someone that the uh, the younger generation, the Merculoffs, the Lysols and so on can lean on. Um, and Pitt looks still got some wheels. You know, he's really fast and so on um as an aging veteran so um hopefully he continues to play well and impress and and um you know it, it proves that he could uh, be signed to a, a full one-year deal which hopefully happens soon um but uh, that remains to be seen and if it happens you just come right here at hl providence hockey report to uh find out the news um all right bud how about some uh transaction talk
All right, let's talk about last week's transactions and which players got promoted to the NHL and which headed down to the Bruins ECHL AA minor pro affiliate, the Maine Mariners. On October 18, 2024, the Providence Bruins released forward Adam Matura from his minor pro contract. The 6'5", 213-pound forward played in one game this season for the AHL Bruins, registering zero points and was a plus one in that game. Matura is now playing for his uh, before the HC Plazen team in his native Czech Republic or Czechia, wherever we're calling it today. Kenny, what are your thoughts on the release of Matura? And, and more particularly, this is a player that I really liked in Maine in the 2023-24 campaign. Thought he came in and really impressed, and I thought he'd be around a little bit longer. Yeah, not even just Maine. I mean, seeing him in the prospect challenge up in Buffalo, he looked really good. He was on a line with uh, with Kuntar, and, and they looked really good, and I was excited to see him in Providence. And, uh, you know, it's he didn't really get much of a chance. It's disappointing. But, again, you look at the roster for Providence, and, and you just – it's tough to see a role, especially since they, they didn't call anybody up after they sent down Tufty. It's just it, – there's just no place, unfortunately. But uh, I wish he could have stuck around longer, but, you know, that's just part of the business. Absolutely. Um, on October 26, 2024, the Boston Bruins placed forward Riley Tufty, as you mentioned, on waivers for the purpose of assignment to the American Hockey League Providence Bruins. Uh, in two games for the NHL Bruins this season, the 6'6", 230-pound versatile forward had zero points. Tufty successfully made it through the waiver process and joined the Providence Bruins. Uh, Kent, Kenny, thoughts on uh, Riley Tufty waving and how he can help the uh, Bruins minor pro affiliate? Yeah, I think this guy is like the perfect mold of what Jim Montgomery's looking like he or looking for. He, you know, he likes the big guys. He likes the guys that could skate, play physical. I just think the the level was a little bit, you know, too fast for him. He was taking a lot of uncharacteristic penalties. This doesn't mean that he's not going to get called back up if Montgomery gets, you know, re-signed. You know, years years from now he could be called up. But uh, like I said, I think it was a little bit too fast. And even though he was a bigger guy, something that I noticed in preseason was sometimes, especially when he's skating with the puck, he was, he was a little bit too soft. He was getting the puck poked away. And it's like, you're so big. Just tap into that size just a little bit more. But I think he could do really, really good things here for Providence. And he played really well when he was with Merkulov and Letary when he was in the uh, in the preseason. So I'd like to see that line combination more. And he just played a game in uh, – uh, against Hershey where that line was there and they did really good things. And again, he was a plus one. So it was, I think that this is a good move for now and we might see him up in, in Boston in the future. Who knows? Absolutely. Okay. Kenny, how about we get into the meat and potatoes of this Providence hockey talk podcast and talk about the two games to start the season um, up to this recording day. How does that sound, bud? Let's do it. All right. On October, I'm, I'm sorry, on Friday night, October 25th, I'm going to do this one more time. Three, two, one. On Friday night, October 25th, 2024, the Providence Bruins hosted the Atlantic Division leading and back-to-back -back Call the Cup champion Hershey Bears. The top minor pro affiliate of the Washington Capitals came into the Amica Mutual Pavilion looking to, uh, to make it two wins in a row after beating the Chicago Wolves 5 to nothing on Sunday, October 20th. Providence got on the board uh, when newcomer Tyler Pitlick, who is on a PTO, scored his first goal of the season at the 345 mark of the first period and was assisted by forward George Mikulov and forward Vinny Letary. The 32-year-old Pitlick skated the puck across the blue line and wristed a shot that went wide, but the veteran forward didn't stop as he skated to the net, getting the puck that ricocheted off the back of the glass where he found his own rebound and chipped it in past Hershey netminder Hunter Shepard for a one to nothing early lead. Pitlick's first goal as a Bruin can be seen and heard here, courtesy of the great folks at Floor Hockey. Standing in the opening period, we'll still scoreless. Now it's Vinny Lazzari, plays it up, middle of the slot, and that one turned away again by Shepard. They kicked it in on a second attempt, and this time it's good! Uh, good goal there from uh, from Pitlick, who just uh, kept the motor running um, and uh, just never quit on the play. So it was uh, really good for a guy on a PTO to skate and, and have the uh, the IQ to do something like that. 
Um, the Hershey Bears would get uh, two goals in the second period and uh, locked the game down defensively to secure the two to one victory over the Providence Bruins. And um, and the 5,600 in attendance at the AMP. Michael DiPietro got the start and goal, taking the loss, stopping 26 of 28 Hershey shots. Providence finished the game out shooting Hershey 39 to 28. Special teams for the Bruins had them go 0 for 4 on the power play, but the penalty kill was impressive, shutting the Bears' four-man advantage attempts. Um, what are your thoughts on this game, Mr. Kenny Kaminsky? Yeah, it was a tough one. Um, I liked the the decision to go with DiPietro, especially with how well he's playing early uh, over Bussy, who was who played the way they've been doing it is Bussy's gone first and then DiPietro, then Bussy, then DiPietro, but then they ended up going back to DiPietro for the first game. Uh, I like that decision just because of just how well he's been playing, and I mean it's it's tough when you get around forty shots and you just can't beat the goalie. Hunter Shepard just out of this world. I mean he played the he played all three games. They were in a three and three here. In New England, he played all three games, even after making 38 of 39 on the first night, which is just unfathomable as a as a fan, as just some guy who plays beer league. Like I can't even believe it that this is that he was able to to play so well for so long. And uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. I mean, when you get 39 shots, you got to be beating the other team. There was a lot of opportunities, and it's uh, it's frustrating, especially when you the, you do the hard part and you create the opportunities, but then you just can't find the twine. But uh, it was definitely, even though it was a loss, like I said early in the season, it it was it was a good look and it was a good game. Yeah, and you were a credential media member for this um, this game, um, and were you? I was. I was not. I did end up oh. going. To the game, though. I did end up going to the game. So oh, I was okay. sitting right. there with the crowd, okay. and I and I don't know why this keeps happening. Uh, the the Providence Bruins always. So far this season, in the four games that they've played at the Amica Mutual Pavilion, they've gotten out to hot starts. They've scored either the first goal or the four, or the first two goals, and they're one and three in those games. I, they're riding the crowd. They're they're getting the energy going, but they just can't sustain it through the game. I do not know why. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, and, and what I've noticed from Hershey, it's such a great team, great tradition, mm-hmm. um, you know, long-time AHL club. Um, what, the history is amazing. Um, and, and if I'm not mistaken, they get like 13 championships now and yeah, back to back, back. Yeah. And, uh, you know, but what I've noticed is they're, they have really good defensive structure on both sides of the puck. Like when the Providence Bruins were trying to cross the, uh, the blue line, they just sh- like stifled them out. They, they really couldn't Providence really couldn't generate a lot of chances when they crossed the blue line, because that team with their forwards and they're covering forwards and, and the way their defensive structure is. It was so, once they crossed the line, it was now we're man on man. It was like you couldn't move. You couldn't breathe. And I think that that's something that the Providence Bruins have to move forward is to is to create um, more on the rush uh, and, you know, create a little more anxiety for, for situations like that. And teams like Hershey, who are so well uh, structured, um, even at their minor pro level with, a uh, you know, a, like a mixed lineup of, of AHL only players and Washington Capitals prospects. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I noticed that a little bit, but I, I didn't really think much about it just because of how much the lines are moving. I know typically the breakouts stay the same, but when you're playing with different players, just, you know, depending on, you know, what's what handle they have, if they're lefty or righty, or, you know, how fast they want to get out of the zone. So, you know, stuff like that's going to happen. It's just going to be growing pains until the lineups and the lines stay the same. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about the next game. All right, on Sunday afternoon, October 27, 2024, the Providence Bruins and Hershey Bears locked back up again for the second game of the weekend at the Amica Mutual Pavilion in downtown Providence, Rhode Island. For the second time the weekend, Providence got off to a hot start scoring early when forward Vinny Letary scored his fourth goal of the season, which led the team at the 5-12 mark of the first period. The lone assist on the Letary goal went to Georgia Mikuloff and can be seen here on the uh, courtesy of the great folks at Flow Hockey. A very clean 
And very fast-paced hockey from both of these sides. Shot, and well, there it is. Score is broken. Providence will open up the contest. Yes, that was, a, I mean, a great face-off win. And a, just an unbelievable release from Vinny Letary seen there uh, from, the, uh, from Flow Hockey. Um, what are your thoughts on, on Letary so far before we go a little further? He's been great, and that shot is just lethal. I mean, I'm in the scouts box for that first game against Laval, and when you have a scout next to you, I mean, you could hear a pin drop in that box usually, but when Letary snipe went over Jacob Dobish's his, uh, his shoulder there, when you hear a scout go, oh, shit, you know you did something right. And what's funny is uh, I was watching the next game in, in Bridgeport, and uh, another beautiful shot over Marcus Hogberg. I mean, this guy is just fine in the back of the net. He's finding the pipe and in. It's just going right for Vinny Letary right now. So, I mean, he's just incredible. Yeah, welcome back. Uh, this is a second tour of duty. <laughs> Played one season. I, I don't think that they could come to an agreement. He chose to sign in his native uh, Minnesota. Um, hung out with the with uh, the Minnesota Wild for a while and their organization um, going up from Iowa to the NHL level back and forth. And then all of a sudden gets traded back to the Boston Bruins and the uh, Jacob Lauco deal. And, and which ended up also being at the um, at Elliot Groenwall pick, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. Yeah. 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 People, so, it, it was, uh, it was actually funny. Like I, I look at the, uh, the comments underneath and I'm, I'm so ecstatic, like seeing the Terry come back and seeing that we picked Elliot Groenwald. And it's just, Hey, Hey, just so <laughs> bad that we're getting rid and I was, I was just, I was so ecstatic. Another one of those things, like when Cascasuo got signed, I was ecstatic. And then I look at the comments, and they're just, it's yeah. just not good. But I just speaking of Cascasuo, how about him adding us on that on that video? Yeah, I was sitting in my bed. I was about to go to bed. I think it was it was like eight or nine o'clock. Uh, and I'm just like, all right, one more YouTube video. I look, and it's just Cascasuo like ten minutes ago posted and I was like all right I'll watch this and then I see the first clip it was somebody else talking about it and then I see Parker so I get on my phone and I text the group chat I'm like oh Parker congrats and then I watch a little bit more and I'm like oh all of us are on there so <laughs> that was definitely cool and I just checked uh 24,000 views on that video so far and it's only 19 hours in and it's just it's wow crazy. and I'm so yeah. I'm appreciative I commented I was like thank you so much oh, for doing this it's insane I did too I did too even if it was just for a couple seconds I was like wow that was class man and yeah. I really hope we didn't say anything bad about him <laughs> no I, I, I said that I said that in the group chat I was like thank god I was pumping this guy's tires because it they right. would have been like yeah I'm not putting these clowns on after all that yes. but it was awesome. That's it was so crazy. Like my face was just red. I was like, "Oh my god, I cannot believe this." Yeah, that was a good moment for all of us. Uh, getting back to this game, uh, Hershey would again lock the game down defensively, squeezing out any Providence Bruins effort to get back into the contest. The Bears would score uh, in the second and third periods to finish the afternoon in Providence with a two to one victory over the NHL Bruins affiliate. Brandon Bussey got the start and goal for the second weekend game against the visiting Bears and came into Sunday afternoon's action with an 0-2 record, along with a 4.61 goals against average and a .857 save percentage. Uh, in this game versus the Bears, he stopped 21 of 23, taking the loss, the third loss of the season. Um Providence would end the game out shooting Hershey for the second time this weekend, this time with a 25 to 23 shot advantage. Special teams for Providence had the bees go 0 for 3 on the power play, but the penalty kill, kill did their job once again, killing off five Hershey bear power play chances. That was a great effort from the PK uh, thoughts on the game on the second game of the weekend against the Atlantic division leaders. Yeah, it's it's so tough because um, I know Bussy had a tough first game against Laval. The whole team did. And then the the next game against Springfield, again, like I felt like he was kind of getting hung out there to dry a lot. And it's just it's tough because he's I feel like he's playing well. And, and you just talked about that period of after getting cut, because I personally thought that Bussy had a had a real good chance to make that, that Bruins opening night roster. And then, you know, he, he was going to make it regardless until Swayman, you know, got signed. So he's in a, he's in a, tif, uh, a difficult 
position there. And it's just, it's tough to keep seeing these games. That's like, he can't really do much else. Like he did everything that he could possibly do. I mean, the goals were were really good for, for Hershey's side. So like, I kind of feel for him. He has career low, like his stats are career low right now, but it, again, it's three games in the season. I'm not looking too much into it, but he's going to be one of those guys. And, and I said it in an article recently about Hershey and how good they are. Their goalies were, were number one and two statistically in the league. And that's why they, they're back-to-back champions. It's because they have that tandem, especially with this rigorous AHL season. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping on this road trip, Bussy can get his first here. But uh, just for the whole game, I felt like they played, they played well again. And it's just, it's hard. They didn't get as many chances as they did that first game where I was like, oh my God, can we please just find the net? But Again, out shooting another like out shooting Hershey again. Hershey's a really good team, so you know what can you do? Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate. Uh, so after uh, so with both regulation losses over the weekend, the Providence Bruins find themselves sitting in the sixth position out of the eight teams in the Atlantic Division uh, with a regular season record of two four and zero and four points. Uh, the Bees are currently on a two game losing streak and have taken a beating on the man advantage. So far in six contests, Providence has been successful once in 23 chances. Providence is hovering around last in the American Hockey League with a power play percentage of 5%. Uh, And the penalty kill that ranks higher around 12 in the league, giving up uh, two goals on 20 some odd chances. Um, I know it's early, but it's this is not great hockey to start the year. I know we talked about it earlier. it's it's not unusual for the AHL level for this Bruins team needing some time to get adjusted and start climbing the Atlantic Division standings. I'm willing to bet the AHL Bruins are in a Calder Cup playoff picture by, by you know the middle of the season, end of end of December. Um, so, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. Like I said, it's 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 really more about developing your prospects, getting you know the next ones. Or the call or recalls. Who's going to be next on the list to get that person ready? Because um, if you know if they're called upon and they're not ready, then it's not a good look on on your development or the coaching staff down in Providence, which is actually really good. Um, but um, yeah, so why don't we move on to uh, another topic on um, the agenda, and that is an article. Um, from a uh, former BNG member, uh, Gail Triani, who moved on from us uh, to work at Nesson. And uh, she reached out to uh, Ryan Mujanel and, um, and, and talked about, you know, the uh, uh, Fabian Lysel, which is technically your top prospect right now. Uh, and obviously the NHL Bruins are having a tough time producing goals offensively at, at that level. But one narrative that is starting to gain serious traction, as you and I know, is Fabian Lysel. Um, and a lot of a lot of people are, are really just, you know, it's it's exciting. It, it's more or less to me, it's like the shiny new toy uh, syndrome. Um, they people as fans are so excited to see this guy play, and I, I just I just don't see it. I really don't see it at all. Um, but Bruins hockey writer Gail Triani at Nesson and former black and gold production scribe for some time recently had a chance to talk to Providence Bruins head coach Ryan Mujanel about the Bees prospect. Uh, and the fourth year AHL head coach had some interesting things to say that might add a little clarity to the 21 year old and how he's been developing thus far. These quotes from Gail's article can be found in the show link below. Uh, and this is what. Uh, Mujanel told the Nesson reporter, uh, the Bruins, the Bruins way is a special way in how we play and uh, what we value. Mujanel told Nesson.com, we don't all come from the same pedigree where we all value different things. He went on to say in Europe, a huge part of the game is possessing and hanging on to pucks. Mujanel explained, they don't chip a lot of pucks in. It's all about creating off the rush some of these concepts when he came here were different and it takes time. His skill is undeniable, Mujanel said. Some of those things that he's got 
to get better at. He recognizes and he's working on it. I like where he's trending. He goes on to mention the Bruins drafted, signed, or traded for you for a reason. They saw something in your game that they liked and they chose you. Just remember that. Even though someone beat you out for a job in Boston, the Bruins still chose you. They like what they see. You just need to work on that, work on your game, develop all around your all around game as a player and as a pro. You keep doing that and things will work out for you. The Bruins already said, we like you, so you just have to keep developing your game. So in all that <laughs> gibberish that I just freaking said, um, what were your thoughts when you when I presented the article to you and said that we should really talk about this on the agenda um, and you read the article? What did you what what feeling did you get from somebody that's been paying close attention to Fabian Lysel and his development, but also the narrative of so many people claiming for this kid to be up in the NHL right now? Well, my first thought was uh, I think I had like two or three thoughts when I was reading through this. The first thing is, is I like that, that Mujanel is saying that he recognizes uh, what he needs to do and he's working on it. Cause that's typically something that fans like us, like we don't get to see, we don't get to know any of that stuff. Like we, he might be stuck in his ways. Who knows? Like, we don't know that, but him reassuring that Lizelle knows what he needs to do and is working on it is something that I like to hear. Um, you know, this, the second thing that I thought and on that quote, where it's like the the Bruins selected you for a reason. Yeah, that's true. But in 2021 to now, the situations are so much different that it, it's it's hard. So the re so they could have brought him in in 2021 and had a plan for him. But you know, we change coaches. It's just there's a ton of different things that that can happen. So it's tough. So even though yes, you know, they picked you for a reason. You know, that reason might not be you know applicable right now to the NHL roster. But um. I wasn't really thrilled uh, watching Lysel. I, like you said, you know, you have that period, uh, not like sulking period, but you have that period where it's like you're bummed out. But uh, I wanted to see some hunger. I, I really haven't. I, and I see the the Swedish part of his game. Like I see him holding onto the puck too long. And uh, there was a play and I, and I, I had to, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't coming on here and, and saying something that was untrue. So I, I made sure to go back and watch the clip over again. And uh, as somebody who's played hockey, like watching clips is, isn't really uncommon. So I'm looking at this clip and I was in attendance at spring uh, against Springfield. It was at um, Providence. And I remember just sitting in my seat, trying not to rip my hair out on this play. It was so it was so egregious. Like, I, I don't even know how to explain it. If you go back to the third period, six minutes left in the game, Providence pieces together another huge shift just in the zone constantly for like two minutes and then they get the puck to the point Lysel gets the puck on the on the far point and then he tries to make a move he gets stripped and he gets uh they they get a breakaway and it's not even i mean the turnover was horrible but just the situational awareness that team is is down they're out for the count just giving them that life especially only being up two goals is just, it, it was just not smart, especially the outlets. If you watch the clip, they have Patrick Brown sitting down low. You could have just chipped it in. Like I, like Mujanel said, like, that's not what they do, but you know, you're playing in the North, you're playing in North America now that that's something that needs to happen. And yeah, he has the skill. He could have skated it through the two players, but instead he tries to be a hero, tries to make probably one of the worst dangles that I've, I've seen in a while. And, and he just gets, he gets stuffed and, and it's tough because when you're watching it as a hockey fan, you can see the game's over. You can see that this team it really can't piece anything together. And then you just give them that. It, it's tough, especially since Providence, you can see that they're already starting to take their foot off the pedal. I mean, it, it's not their fault. They've been dominating the whole game. You know, it's time to start playing a little keep away. But I just I wasn't really too, too thrilled with that play. And uh, I haven't really been thrilled with what Lizelle has done this season. And I, I knew when this happened, I was watching the game. I clipped it, posted it to Twitter. I knew fans were going to just eat up that goal against Springfield. It was a nice goal. But uh, when I was, when I was thinking about preseason, 
one of his issues was he wasn't using his speed to create space and he didn't use his speed to create space. He just kind of chipped it through a guy and it was a save that Colin Ellis probably should have made, but nonetheless, it was a nice goal. I'm not going to take that away from him, but that's, that's kind of where I've been. And I know me and you have kind of seen eye to eye and we've been battling together on Twitter against these people that think Lysel should just be called up for the hell of it. So. Yeah. And you know, it, and to each their own, and that's fine. Um, but it, it, a lot of the time, it's like I really wish people would see his game, uh, you know, away from the puck, and and you know, and that's what a lot of like folks like you, myself, um, Mark Diver, you know, a lot of the guys that cover this this Providence Bruins team through and through. Uh, see on a regular basis and and a lot of the times it's like those plays are not going to get you in the nhl um and i i just and i said this on the black and gold hockey podcast several times that this is still an organization that you have to work and prove yourself nothing's given to you so i don't understand where fans get off just saying you won't know and you won't know until you see what you have you know, I would much rather have that opportunity be earned than rather just given. Um, because if it's given and it's not earned and he does a play like you mentioned, just go, kind of goes in there, doesn't chip and chip and uh, chase and so on, gives up the puck and a turnover. You know, you went from a potential 13 minute night down to a six minute night if you do shit like that. So I just don't see the translation of what fans are looking at and, and their expectations from what people that do dedicate a lot of time to watching. And this is why I always like say, get the flow hockey package. It's through $29.99. You get a ton of hockey. So AHL, ECHL. It's mm. freaking worth it. It's so worth it. Um, and, and watch the games, you know, you might not be able to see what you see at live from us and, and what you, you know, when you buy a ticket, you know, if he's sulking on the bench, you know, because I know the camera moves around and so on during streams. Um, but, you know, I, I just I, I, I don't see the. I don't I just don't see the, 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 you know, I just don't think he has it completely between the ears right now to be a, a consistent NHL player. And I just don't understand why a lot of people don't get that either. You know, I and this is and I hate being this this kind of ass, but. You know, it is it is such a shiny new toy um, theory that, you know, we just place them in there and, and, and have them figure it out. And I just totally disagree with that. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I hate I hate even like saying this. I hate being the guy to be like, no, this prospect isn't playing well. Let's not call him up. But I, I just find it funny on Twitter. Like, do you look at my account like I watch all the games and you don't. So I don't know why you're, you're telling me that Lizell deserves a spot and you're right. I don't, I don't think, I don't agree with people saying, Oh, let's just throw him up there for the hell of it and see what he does. Like, no, if he's making these turnovers and he's making these problems and creating issues and not getting himself open in the AHL, what makes you think he could do it in the NHL? Other than that one goal that he had against the Capitals in the preseason, he was kept off the, off the score sheet every night. And and he, he had his opportunity. I know fans were pissed that he got sent down, but then he got immediately called back up. He played, what, six out of the seven games, five out of the seven games? He had his chance, and he just hasn't done it. And if he came down to the AHL and played hungry, he probably could have been on the roster by now. So there's a reason why he's not there right now. And I keep trying to say, you know, let's let's pump the brakes a little bit, but people just don't listen. So hopefully if you're if you're listening now, you're starting to understand. It's a lot easier for me to tell you instead of typing it out. So, yeah. And and another thing is, I brought it up on the Black and Gold Hockey podcast either this past one or the previous uh, week. But in my research about call ups and and like, you know, who was the one that really pushed the needle for the Bruins to say, "I'm going to sit this healthy NHL contracted player." because I want to get a look at this prospect. And it goes back to 2015 and 16 when Frank Vetrano went 36 games and he posted 36, 19, and 55 numbers. In those 36 games, the Boston Bruins were forced to give this kid a chance to see what they have at the NHL level. And that year he played in the NCAA, 
uh, at UMass. He played for Providence, and he also played in the NHL. I'm not too sure on how many people have actually done that. But that's what I'm talking about. Since 2015 and 16, no prospect in the Boston Bruins organization has forced the Bruins' hand to get him up and get games. It's been via an emergency recall when they actually were able to give a prospect a chance to show what they have because you need to fill the roster. So I'm also going with the trends here as well. When I see a, a player like Fabian Lysel not having the complete game, I'm not saying every prospect has to go out and rip out 36 goals in 36 games just to get a recall. But you do have to show some signs of life like you want to be an NHL player and on a consistent basis. And and for me, in all these years dating back to what happened with Frank Vitrano, I have not seen any prospect force the hand of the Boston Bruins to say, I'm sitting that guy, you're in. Yeah, and, and even if Lysel put up, you know, five points in the last six games, it, it doesn't take away from the issues off the puck that he has. And I think it would just make it harder for these thick-headed Bruins fans who want him to, to be at that next level to understand that he, he isn't playing a complete game. And that's some of the issues that we're seeing in Boston. We're just putting another player up there that isn't going to be able to play the whole 200 feet. It, it just, it's not the right situation right now. And it's not, it's not that it's not going to be in the future, but as of this moment right now, Lysel does not look ready. And um, that's why he's not up. Yeah. And, and the fact is, um, a lot of people are saying, well, there's no salary cap space to bring up a, a guy that's making $895,000. Well, now there is because Riley Tufty went down. You increase your salary cap space. So now you have $1.1 million to, and I'm air quoting here, to successfully get Tyler Johnson, a veteran forward, under contract. But a lot of folks are saying, okay, now we have money to bring up Lysel. And that didn't happen over the weekend. As Dominic Tiano, a good friend of ours, um, mentioned that if he plays on Friday night, then he's probably not going to get recalled um, to uh, Boston for Saturday night's game against Toronto. And that didn't happen. So, you know, I don't know what to say to the, to the fans out there that are just like ripping you and I for being like, you guys are anti-prospect and this and that. It's like, no, it's just we, we're – we are seeing things differently. And 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 for those people that call us anti-prospects, it's, it's because you don't want to put the time in to actually see what's going on. You're looking at the, fa the fancy highlights that people like my boy Kenny over here are sharing and Iman, our company colleague, and everybody else that's sharing these awesome, you know, this and that. You're seeing one side of the game. You're not seeing the whole package. But... Anyway, let's move on from Fabian Lysel. And I just want a, a little disclaimer because I got to do that in a soft world these days. We're not hammering the prospect. We don't hate the prospect. We both, Kenny and I, want Fabian Lysel to succeed. We want him to go down and get that bag of money that Ryan Mujanel and Trent Whitfield and Matt Thomas are all telling these prospects down there. It's right there. You just got to go get it. We want that. To, we want a player like him to be successful. Um, so no anti-prospect here. If we were anti-prospect, will we talk about Providence Bruins hockey? Yeah, would we have a? Would we be doing a pro, uh, prospect podcast right now? No, of course not. Exactly. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next topic, and uh, that is, uh, you know, it, it's been six games, and it's been a small sample size. But who are our standouts so far this year? Kenny, why don't you go first? Um, I think my personal standout, I, I think that there, we, we've been struggling to score. So I'm going to take it to a goalie. Michael DiPietro has been night and day different from what we saw in the preseason. He's a smaller goalie, six foot one. So the fact that he even got to this point as a smaller goalie is incredible as it is. But when you watch him in Boston, he looked like a six foot one goalie. He was playing deep. He was a little bit hesitant and they were picking him apart. But now you would have no idea. You see him in Providence. He's making huge saves. He's presenting himself big. He's making it difficult for people to, to pick corners on him. And um, the first game, 
against Bridgeport, I watched in, in that first goal that he gave up against Pierre Engvall, where it kind of just trickled under the arm, and it, it's a it's a little bit of a backbreaker. I just wanted to see how he would respond to that, and he played lights out the rest of the night. So just watching Di Pietro, uh, it's like, who is this guy? Who is this guy that we that we saw in Boston who was hesitant and, and giving up goals and, and letting players come down and shoot and all that? This guy's like just completely different. He's playing so well. And this is what Providence has needed as bussy has been, you know, he, he had a tough start out of the gate. So this is huge. Yeah. And even um, DPH who had a really good year last year. Uh, some would say he was, he was the better goaltender than bussy last year, which I kind of think, yeah, you know, I, I could, I could jive with what a lot of people are saying when it comes to comparables on, on the stat sheets. Um, but yeah, Mike, uh, DiPietro, a uh, huge, huge year last season in his development, which I think was important because, um, you know, the year before he was playing in pro in, um, Maine in the ECHL coming over here from Vancouver in the trade for Jack Sinica and so on. And, and I believe, uh, the, the Vancouver Canucks like criminally mismanaged, uh, his, his, um, his year uh, making him a third goaltender during the whole COVID thing. Um, and I, I'm totally against, I mean, go out and get uh, like an AHL veteran to be your third goaltender. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, Abbotsford did play some games. Um, I, I think because Providence that year played 25 games. I mean, it's still mm -hmm. game action, but they basically didn't play him at all and just having him as the third goaltender. I just said, I, I think that took a little bit, uh, a year off of his development. So when he came to the Boston Bruins organization, starting off in the ECHL with Maine, I thought he really wanted to get back to where he was. And he was using it by really good methods that were being taught by uh, people like um, Goalie Bob Asenza and even Mike Dunham. Mike Dunham has been a, tr a, a tremendous asset to the goalie uh, tutelage or, or, or the, the teachings of goalies uh, in the organization. He's been a great asset to have. And he's the guy that travels around. Mike Dunham uh, is the one that travels around to see all the prospects and so on. So, um, you know, just to get him back to where he is now. And then now he's competing hard for like number one jobs down in the American Hockey League. So it's good to see. And I agree with you. Um, you know, he's been a, probably Providence's best player as of right now. Um, I'll take, uh, I'll take this one. I really like what I'm seeing from Jordan Osterley, uh defenseman. I think he's been a really good asset to the Providence Bruins since coming down uh, from NHL training camp. Um, he's, if I'm not mistaken, he's leading the team in points. Uh, he's been a little quiet lately, but uh, he did have a really hot start. Um, but I like what I see from him. Um, and um, Vinny Letary for my forward, uh, you know, he's, I like what he's done. Um, you know, a veteran returning to Providence. Uh, I think that he sooner or later, um, you know, there might be a lineup where you see Mikulov and, and Letary and Lysel on the same thing, but it just depends on where Mujina wants to go because it's still, it is still early in the season. Um, uh, Patrick Brown, I've seen some really good things so far, um, but it is, it's only six games. So it's really hard to like really come down and like figure out who's, you know, been really good and, and, and not so good. So uh, do you have anybody else that you want to talk about? Yeah, I think you, uh, you hit it on the head with the uh, Osterley and Letary. I mean, I would like to see more as a top prospect, but Georgie Merkulov has been doing a good job of getting his teammates open and, it's it's tough because he's doing so well at that but that's what he does well always like he it, it was never in question about his elite vision that he has and the way and you see some of these passes and the, even the one in Bridgeport where Letary scored made a nice behind the back pass and it, it's just uh something that we saw in Boston that he didn't have was his shot and and you look at last season he was such a threat on the power play and he's just not touching the puck as much on the power play which is tough his one timer it's funny, like I, I compare it to Ovechkin, but it's not like Ovechkin. It's a, it's like a snapshot 
he scored so many from that same area last year and in the power play struggles i'm like can you just stand there and worry about getting a shot off and he had opportunities to get that shot off in boston but he he uh, hesitated and decided to try to make other plays with his vision, which I understand, you know, you're comfortable with it. You're doing really well with it. So going back to that at the biggest stage makes sense. But um, yeah, four assists in, in six games, every single game he's played with Vinny Letary. And I think that's been huge for both of their success. Um, yeah. And, and Lizell, when he was struggling offensively, they, they put him on a line with, um, with Letary and Merkulov and he, um, he scored. Lizell scored. So I think that there's been so many roster moves. I mean, if you've watched and there's, there's just been so much movement in the lineup, the one of the only consistent part parts of the lineup has been Merkloff and Letary playing together. And I think that they should just keep this rolling all season. As long as it's working, no need to change yeah. it. No, I, I totally agree. But when you, when you talk about Mikulov, you talk about Lysel and, and their releases and so on, and and Letary, who's who's really got a good release as well, is how come these players are not getting it done on the man advantage? That's the one thing that really uh, frustrates me is they've got one goal and twenty three chances. Um, it, it obviously, it's, it, like I said, it's early. Things are going to change. I think the uh, the power play will will get better, but as of right now, it's just not clicking. No, it's it's so tough because it's like you have so much skill. But I, I said it, and I think that it, it, it might it might need a, a change at that quarterback position. The way they set up that that one three one or the umbrella, whatever you want to call it, just just having somebody like Mer Merkulov, I would think would be great. It's it's a position where you need to be careful because if you turn the puck over, it's an instant breakaway the other way. But when you have somebody like Merkulov who has that elite vision on the ice, I think that could pair well at that at that position. And they had Osterley play that position on the second power play unit and the second power play unit has arguably been better than the first power play unit and they only get like 30 seconds of power play in my eyes i thought they were they've played better with farinacci and kuntar like I, I just thought that they were a better fit and then i don't know maybe it's just so much skill that's out there and everybody is a threat i don't know what it is right now but you know it's the ahl it's the beginning of the season 4.3 percent is terrible especially given all the uh all the skill that they have, but I, I'm, I just think they need one. They need one to just break open the floodgates and then the power play will be back to normal, but it, it's tough because they do such a good job getting on the power play and drawing so many penalties. And then it's just, they can't capitalize on it. And, and it's tough. Yeah. All right, let's move on to the next topic. And that is the week ahead. So tomorrow night, I, I, all right. Three, two, one. All right, let's uh, discuss the week ahead for the Providence Bruins as the club is gearing up for the three-game road trip up in up north to Canada to face the Belleville Senators in the province of Ontario and then travel east to the province of Quebec for two games over the weekend against the Laval Rocket. <laughs> All right, on Wednesday night, uh, October 30th, uh, the Providence Bruins play the Belleville Senators, um, which is tomorrow night, and it is game one of uh, the three-game road trip. Um, it's crazy that these two teams only face each other uh, twice in the last five years with how close they actually are uh, to in proximity. Uh, Providence lost both of uh, those games, by the way. Um, but yeah, it's just it, it is absolutely crazy that the the American Hockey League does not travel further out. But I do understand why. Um, and and one of the coaches uh, back in Manchester with the Manchester Monarchs, uh, uh, Mark Mark Morris, I believe his name was, uh, mentioned to me the reason why we play Springfield and 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 Providence and Lowell and all these teams twelve times is because. You want to spend your time developing your prospects by practicing them on a daily basis and less travel. So that kind of made sense to me. You know what I mean? That if you if you're traveling all around, you're really not getting the ice time that you need, and you're pretty much only playing games. So uh, it kind of resonated with me a little bit. 
Um, the AHL Senators currently sit in the fourth position in the North Division with a regular season record of 3 1 0 oh, 2 in eight, in eight points. The Sens are 2 1 1 at home at the CAA Arena in Belleville, Ontario. Um, the the Sens got a 2 to 1 shootout victory over North Division rival Toronto Marlies over the weekend on Saturday night and look to make it two games in a row with Providence in town. Uh, thoughts on this game and what the AHL Bruins need to do to kick off this three-game uh, roadie on Wednesday night? Uh, I think the teams are are very similar. Like, I, if you look at the the Senators this season, they've they've struggled to score goals. Their penalty kill is uh, slightly below average, so I'd like to see them take it on the power play. That would be huge if they can get a power play goal. But, uh, you know, this is the first road trip of the season, like real road trip. It's not like they're going to Springfield or they're going to Hartford, which is like, you know, 50, 50 an hour minutes. Said that horribly, but 50 minutes or an hour away. But uh, I like this early in the season, get the players bonded and all that. I think it could be good for some of these younger guys who have yet to score a point, like Jackson Edward, Freddie Brunet, uh, Joey Abate, like all those guys. Uh, this Senators team is – is tough a little bit or they're having a tough stretch right now because their goalie mad sogar just got injured he's going to be out so they just they just signed uh former bruin malcolm suban to a contract and then um their top point getter is i think he's he's been called up but he is inactive so uh i think this is a game where you want to take it because you don't know how Laval is going to play it's a team that you've played before but they're different since logan mayu has been called up Definitely starting a road trip with a bang, with a big win, is going to be huge, especially going back-to-back -back against Laval. So I just think getting out of the gate quick, and it's it's also something to think about is, is who you're going to start in net because of just you want Bussy to get that that first win, but you also want to start off strong. And, you know, going with DiPietro is probably a better bet at this moment. So, but I'm just, I'm excited to see it. And, and you talked about, you know, the, that they play people 12 times in a season. I've personally always loved that being from Connecticut because it's a pain to go up to Providence and, and watch the games. But if I could just go to Bridgeport, you know, that's 30 minutes compared to two hours. So yeah. going to Bridgeport and being able to watch my team is, is, is good. I like that. I would prefer it actually. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Let's talk about the next game. On Friday night, the Providence Bruins are at Place Bell in Laval, Quebec to face the Laval Rocket, the top minor pro affiliate of the Montreal Canadiens, who are in second place in the North Division, three points behind division-leading Toronto Marlies. After six games in the 2024-25 regular season, the Rocket of 5-1-0 in the year and uh, is currently on a four-game winning streak. Laval is perfect, 3-0 and at Place Bell this season. And uh, in those three games, have outscored their opponents five, or outscored the visitors five, uh, 10 to five. Sorry. Uh, the last time Providence and Laval faced each other was uh, uh, when Laval beat the Bruins five to two at the Amica Mutual Pavilion. And that's the game you went to. Yes. Okay. All right. My mistake earlier, my man. <laughs> it's all good. Um, uh, thoughts on on game two of the current road trip and and this time shifting over to Quebec, Kenny? I think this is going to be a good test because the thorn in the side of Providence that first game was the defense of Laval. They had four of the five goals. I mean, Logan Mayu just tore the younger guys to shreds. So like I said earlier, yeah, and he so and he's been called up. So, but there, you know it. They're so skilled. I mean, every player is so skilled, but there was a few times that I had to look down at the sheet just to see, like, is this guy a defenseman? I cannot believe his edges are so good. But like I said, I think this is going to be a good test early in the season. Like you saw that first game. It wasn't it wasn't good at all, but they've played so much better. Like, I feel like if they could play that same game, like the first game against Hershey. Like they're go They're going to get wins. It's it's just how many can you get? So if they can keep putting shots on and if they can keep the pressure and they can get 40 shots, like if you get 40 shots every game, you're, you're never going to lose. Like, or I guess you might lose a few times, but 
<laughs> like it's just it's difficult. It's difficult. Make it just difficult on them. I think that that team is very young compared to to Providence. So there should be there should be no problem. But like I said, I'm excited to see it. It's a good placement. You you saw the first game. It was not good. Now you're back a few weeks later. The roster is a little bit different. They've, now Providence has Pitlick and Tufty. So I'm just excited to see what they can do. Yeah, absolutely. All right. The next game um, against Laval. On Saturday afternoon, the Providence Bruins once again face the Laval Rocket at Place Bell. And we already talked about these two teams for, for game one on the weekend. So I don't believe we need to regurgitate anything. But I'll I'll add a little bit of um, context to uh, my thoughts on this road trip, and particularly the Laval Rocket, who, have, who are just, they're playing really, really well this year uh, and off to a great start. Um you know, Providence has got to come out and, and play their game, play with pace and so on. I know it's very cliche, but um, play to your advantages. Uh, try to find ways that you to be better than what you have uh, put out on the ice recently. And I like road trips like this because I, I think that it gets the guys together. You know what I mean? And, and you know, you figure out ways, the camaraderie and so on. You figure out ways to win on trips like this. So um, this could be a really good starting point to go into Belleville, go over to Quebec, play two in Laval, and then come home. And, uh, you know, I would say start to pick up your your the pieces of putting together a strong 2024-25 regular season um, and not wait till, you know, late December to, to finally wake up and then, you know, try to make your way into the call to cup um, playoffs uh, with the remainder remaining half a season. Um, but there's, there's a lot of things that can happen. The, the, the American hockey league and the ECHL rosters are, to, are in always in flux, right? Cause you don't know who's going to be called up. You don't know who's going to be called down. It can be very challenging for coaches. Um, and, and some coaches, it can be very easy. But when it comes to chemistry and line chemistry and, and you know, camaraderie on each line, it's a little different uh, when you see different players all the time. Because, I mean, Providence is that middle factor of the organization. Um, when you need a call up, they go up. And when you need to send somebody down, they go down. So um, I just want to see a good effort. And, and, and th this might be a trip where, you know, I think Brandon Bussey is going to get one game in. And I think that he's going to steal one to get himself into a rhythm himself. Um, I believe Brandon's a tremendous, uh, he has a tremendous work ethic. I think he can snap out of what's going on right now, um, you know, and and be the goaltender that he can be. And, and, and who knows? I mean, there's still a lot of time for him to play well that could push Boston to say, okay, well, Maybe Corpusalo is not doing so good. Maybe we should give Bussy a look for his first time in the NHL. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen this season. But to me, this this road trip really, you know, means that these guys get to come out and prove who they are to the to not only the rest of the, uh, the Atlantic Division but also the rest of the league. All right, let's move on to our final. Uh, topic and that's uh, one of our favorites. Uh, I'm a big guy. I, I love questions. So we went out and uh, asked uh, our friends and fans about some questions, some Providence Bruins related questions. So why don't we get into that? How's that sound, Ken? Let's do it. All right. So we'll start off with this one right here. This is from Jason Cook and you can follow him on Twitter slash X at Cook journalism uh who do you think will be the first call up this season hashtag ask phr and before you answer that kenny i want to say if you want to submit a question to this providence hockey report podcast on twitter x or, or anywhere um please use the hashtag ask phr because what that does is it keeps us uh, um accountable to track all the questions 
So we answer them all. We won't answer the really bad ones or the waste of time ones, but the good ones we will definitely um, uh, get to. But if you use that hashtag ask PHR, we can, we can track them all. So um, start sending them as soon as possible and we'll do our best to answer them. But Kenny, uh, who do you think the first call up would be uh, for the Boston Bruins from Providence? Yeah, it's, it's tough to answer this question because as of now, there's no roles and there's no players that are really, like you said, pushing that limit. So it's basically going to be who do they need on that emergency basis. If it's lower in the lineup, like if it's the third or the fourth line, you could see a guy like like Kuntar if he could start picking up his play. I know he has zero points right now. Obviously, if they need a goalie, I would actually love to be in that conversation room seeing who they want to call up because – you know, DPH was playing well, but Bussy, I think, is more NHL ready. And then, uh, you know, if somebody gets injured on that, on the wings, you could see a guy like, uh, like Lizell get called up, even if he's not ready, unfortunately. But again, there's also other players that are ready. Like, like I would love to see Letary get called up. I don't know if it's going to happen, but, and then, you know, if a center gets injured, Patrick Brown, I know it's tough calling up a captain, but, uh, or you can have Merkulov up there as well. It's just, you have no idea because, nobody's really pushing that pace and there's uh, it's basically whoever just gets injured. Yeah. I mean, for me, if a recall needs to happen, I think that everybody's going to get promoted up at the NHL level where in Providence, they would recall somebody that is, can play the fourth line role seamlessly, you know, that, and that's your Patrick Browns, you know, or that's, as of right now, it's Trevor Kuntar or somebody else who, who, in my opinion, I like Ryan Mujanel and I'm not, I'm not shitting on him at all, but I sometimes think that he's mismanaging Kuntar's minutes. Um, I, I just think Trevor's got more to offer offensively in his skill set and speed and, and not just be a, a fourth line grinder and so on. And I don't know. I would like to see him get um, some some second line or even some first line minutes sometime soon, just to, I don't know, kind of see what we have in him, you know, um, because he could possibly make the roster or, or, you know, even um, Riley Duran could also make the roster next year. If there's, uh, if there's openings uh, for a prospect to, you know, to come in and, um, you know, get some consistent NHL time, but, yeah, I, I if my first call up would probably because I'm a trendy guy, you know, I'm, I'm not on. Oh, this guy's gonna make it because he's he's got the most points. I think it, you know, I think it'll be a player like like um, like Captain Brown. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with that, and I think that you know Kuntar's so young that I, I kind of just want to see where his limits are right now, and he, and he really hasn't been tested. He hasn't had a lot of time to to be on the ice and and I I just like when you have these younger guys who aren't aren't producing and it's not necessarily his fault he hasn't been getting that much time but maybe just a few games here or there just put him on that second line or first line I mean we see we've seen a, a whirlwind of players play on that first line with Letary and Merkelhoff and and they've always had good games Pitlick Lysel, like it always picks them up. So, you know, it would definitely be good to see somebody like Kuntar or Duran or Abate maybe take on that first oh, line or second line role. Joey. Yeah, I always keep forgetting about Joey. Yeah. Good player. All right. Um, moving on to the next one. This is fellow Black and Gold Hockey Podcast um, co host David Collins. You can follow him on Twitter or X at DC underscore 709. David asks, who on the current roster do you see being with the big club in five years? Hashtag ask B and G. Interesting question. <laughs> oh, you know, this is what I get because I like I like going on to the black and gold podcast and giving you guys stumpers, but now it's you know it's <laughs> happened to me. It's not as fun. It's coming five full years, circle, my man. <laughs> yeah, I, this is what I deserve. So I'll, I'll try to answer this to the best of my ability, but five years is such a long time. It's such a long time frame. Even like five years ago, like I'm 18, I was 13 In five more years, I'll be 23. Like when I'm 23, who's going to be on that team? Like, I don't know. And it's honestly crazy that I, I, I think I know this. Um, 
five years ago would have been the 1920 season. And I was looking at old rosters. I didn't even know this was a question, but I'm glad I was looking at the rosters. But the 1920 season, there's only one player that's still even with the organization, and it's Trent Frederick. Every other player on the roster isn't even with the organization anymore. So in five years, it, it, it's so difficult, especially with the Bruins, because you look at teams like Arizona was in Utah. It's like you could see the pipeline because you know that they're not really getting – big free agents coming in. You know if you're a first-round pick for Arizona, unless you get traded, you're going to be on that team in five years. That's just how it is. But with Boston, and especially this year, like if you were to ask me, you know, back uh, after they lost the series to Florida, you know, who's going to step in and, and fill some of these roles, I would have said some of these AHL guys, but they don't need that because they get, you know, players coming over from, you know, free agency and stuff like that. But, I mean, it's tough. I don't know. There's there's so much that goes into five years in the future, but if I could pick one, I would probably say Jackson Edward. And I know it's tough because that the decor sewn up for so long. I know that the top four are at least going to be signed for the next four years, but then you don't know because maybe they get traded. So it's just it's five years is just so long is is what I'm going to say. Five years is so long. I don't even know. Yeah, this is a. Um... Uh, put me in a mind pretzel because of the five years. If if it was two years, yeah, it, it'd be. I don't know. It kind of would be the same. Um, but I'm just gonna dovetail on what you're talking about. Like uh, with Jackson Edward, I can actually see him being maybe a couple years early getting NHL time. Uh, obviously, with the departure of a of a, a, a defenseman like Andrew Peak, who's got a couple more years under contract. Um, you know, if he's not moved or or whatever, uh, I think he's playing been playing you know pretty decent for a third line third pairing guy. Um, but Jackson Edward is is somebody intriguing because he plays that real nasty game. You know, if you're coming in the zone, you know when he's on the ice, um, you need to watch out for him because uh, he plays on the edge. You know, he'll, he he plays rough and heavy, and you know can move the puck as well. Um, um jesus i i I would really want to say if we're talking about five years i mikulov and lysel would be on the big club in five years you know um you know second third lines whatever um i don't know that's tough that's a tough one david uh you you definitely got me but you got the better answer out of uh, out of our boy here (laughs) yeah well listen all i said was it's a long time and uh (laughs) I just wanted to share this concern. Uh, I'm a, you know, like I said, Bridgeport is is right down the street, and they had a really good prospect that is eerily similar to Georgie Merkeloff, where he was uh, he was a shorter guy, played top line, really skilled, but he didn't get his his opportunity. His name was Ruslan Asakov, and he he didn't get his opportunity with the Islanders, so he ended up just bolted over to Russia. And I hope that doesn't happen with Merkelov because uh, he's, he's a talent and I, I would like to see him on the team. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's move on to the next question. And that's from our, our very own Iman McLean. Iman, uh, you can follow him on Twitter slash X at Iman McLean 44. That's at E A M O N N M C L E A N 44. He asked, do you think any players currently in Providence will finish the season in Boston? If so, who? Hashtag ask PHR. Um, I, well, to finish the season in Boston. So that, that puts me down a rabbit hole here of, okay, where's Boston going to be in the rankings? And is it at a comfortable position where call-ups can be made? Um, to give those uh, air quote thank you, uh, organizational thank yous, um, you know, to some some players that m- might even be playing in their first ever NHL experience. Um, but um, I could see Brandon Bussey being uh, somebody at the end of the season getting some games. Um, he might even be involved earlier if if he pushes the envelope of of Unico Pasalo and how he's currently playing. Or, or in the future, how he's playing at that particular time. Um, I could see Lysel. I mean, that right now, right now in this season, I can't see um, this team calling up Fabian Lysel. 
but I could see it later on if if some veterans needed to rest um, and then, you know, create some time to get his uh, NHL. McHugh off the same thing. Duran, um, you know, you can go down the line, even even some veterans, Osele, um, you know, Letary and so on, because at that point, you know, you don't, you could put them down and they might not even get claimed on waivers um, or just hang on to them for the rest of the season. Uh, but I mean, those are just some quick ones uh, that could just come to mind. I didn't really jot anything down, but um, yeah, that's about all. Uh, yeah. I mean, you basically hit it on the head. I think my pick would have been Brandon Bussey, just the way that, Corpus Allo has has started the season, but uh, Eamon, I know you're a uh, you're a big prospect guy. So when this comes out, why don't you tell me who you think is going to be exactly. uh, on the team at the end of the season? I love hearing opinions. We're we're like one of the uh, the only podcasts out there that do that do Providence Bruins stuff. So you know, if anybody like you can answer your own question like underneath. Like I, I would just love to see what what you guys are thinking as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, moving on to the next one. It is our very own Black and Gold Hockey Podcast main host, not fired by popular uh, opinion or, or narrative out there. Uh, we did not fire him. Uh, Sam Smith, you can follow him on Twitter, uh, X, and, and all other social media, at Sam Smith on Y2, YT. So that's at S-A-M-S-M-I-T-H-O-N-Y-T. He says, what are your thoughts on Fabian Lysel and Georgie Mikulov? Hashtag ask PHR. Pretty much, if you were listening up to this point, we have said a lot about these two players, more particularly Fabian Lysel. This is about like the Fabian Lysel show, basically. Um, but uh, I'll just go back uh, and, and, you know, to give Sam an answer. Uh, work in progress. There's a lot of things that we do like. Um but I think this is a year that he really needs to focus on getting it. It meaning, um, you know, what is going to get you to that next level consistently. That's the it factor for me. Um, it's got to be between the ears. I, I'm not questioning his heart. I'm not questioning his skill set. It's just, you know, when Mujanel last year, called him out basically on a, on a video uh, that was black and gold productions uh, from Jason cook. And that thing went viral. Um, you know, I, after that video was, was released and so on, I think I, we saw him respond. It took a little while, but then he responded and played well uh, to finish out the season, but it was not well enough in my opinion, like Don Sweeney, if he didn't get injured, he was going to get recalled. I don't believe that to be true. I, I think that he was going to be in Providence for the full for the full boat, um, regardless, because of the it, the inconsistencies and and some of the some of the stupid mistakes that you know kids make. You know, it, it is what it is. But um, Mikulov, I I really didn't see much of him at 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 the uh, NHL level and. I know p fans are going to come at me and say, well, he's only given four games and he wasn't in, he wasn't put in a great position. I, to me, I, I don't know if it's because I'm old school or, or what, but I also believe that if you're playing on the third line um, and you play well, they promote you, but you still have to play well to show that you belong in that third line period. Um even when he was on the fourth line for that one game, I was horrified. Um, I just didn't see enough in, in in his four games to really, you know, blow up that we need him at the NHL level either this year or next year. But uh, another one that needs to work hard, and, and if he wants to continue in this Boston Bruins organization, you know, he's got to get it too in between the, uh, the ears and figure it out. Um, another one that's got the skill set, the talent, the heart, I believe, you know, it's just, it's just, it's right there. It's just, these, it's so close that they're, they're not just not able to grab it. What are your thoughts, bud? Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it quick because I know we were trying to keep this podcast at that hour mark. And if you, if you let me talk about Fabian Lizell or Georgie Merkulov, I'll, I'll go on forever. So uh, I think <laughs> Lizell, I, I just want to, I just want to see more. I want to see more of the stuff off the puck. I want to see him play smarter on the puck 
And then Merkulov, who I guess I would say is like my favorite prospect. I, I just want to see him, you know, hesitate less. Something that we saw in in Boston was his issues with the faceoffs, and those look to be, you know, better now that he's in Providence. And I know it's a little bit different, you know, playing in the preseason when you play against NHL guys, they're a lot stronger. But um, yeah, he he's still getting the assist, he's still putting up points, and that that's good and all. But I want to see goals. I want to see him start shooting the puck more. And that was another issue that we saw in Boston, where he just wasn't getting the shots off, and he wasn't getting shots in general. And I. It, he's kind of just been transparent out there. He makes that one big play to get the assist, but then everything else has kind of just been, is he even out there on the ice? Like it's, so we, it's just two things. It's simple for me to say, but it's difficult for them to do. Like it's, it, it takes time. So uh, I know both of them last year on the contract. So I'm hoping that they, they come back and, and they maybe need one more year in Providence, but then they, they join the big club. So I, I just, I'm wishing them the best. And uh, I'm wishing Providence the best, and I'm wishing Boston the best. Like I just want to see them succeed. So that that's just what I've seen. Yeah, well said. All right, that, that is going to do it because I want to watch this uh, Boston Bruins game against the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, yeah, this was a little longer than I thought, but uh, uh, I want to thank you very much for joining me, Kenny, on this uh, new endeavor. Um, we're going to be doing this weekly, folks. So uh, please subscribe on the uh, the YouTube. Uh, by hitting the subscribe button and the um, and give us a thumbs up. It really helps us. And also go on Apple Podcasts and, and Spotify and iHeartRadio and subscribe on there. And please give us a five-star uh, rating also with a written review. Um, tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Uh, tell us what we what, what can improve on. We would love to hear the feedback. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, until – we're going to talk about the three games that are coming up uh, tomorrow night in Belleville and then this this weekend's games, uh, both in Laval. Uh, we'll talk about those next week and provide a nice little highlight package. Hopefully the Bruins score goals and we can add more than just two. You know, hopefully yeah. they, you know, you know, come out and I'm going to put Kenny to work here. Hopefully they do a nine to five and a 12 to two. Hey, listen, I would sick. love that. That just that just <laughs> makes my, my Twitter pop off more the more I keep posting those clips. So I'm fine with exactly. it. Let's do it. Let's, let's win. Awesome. All right. Um, you can follow me uh, on Twitter, X at Black and Gold 277. And you can follow my boy Kenny over here on Twitter and X at Kenny Kaminsky. Kenny, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to Parker McLean, a uh, uh, fellow BNG administrator here for setting this all up that I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, so it's a work in progress, but I, I think we, uh, we had fun today and I really appreciate it. And, and sorry about some, uh, some tough moments in this podcast as we're trying to get it off and running and, you know, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, so, um, things will get better. So please stick with us. But, um, uh, with that being said, my name is Mark Allred. I am a host of the Providence hockey report. Um, we will talk next week. Goodbye. <laughs>